I've been lucky enough to play around with a lot of high-end motherboards here on my YouTube channel, and that's because they get sent to me for product launches and for reviews and for builds that I do and stuff, but I often wonder who actually buys these things? Who pays $700 or more for something like an MSI Godlike or an Asus ROG Extreme or Gigabyte Aorus Extreme motherboard? I have no idea, to be perfectly honest. I've never met anyone who's just bought one of these types of boards straight up, but today I'm going to do my best to stand up for these overpriced monstrosities by asking an even better question than who buys them. What features do boards like these have that you might actually want that a lowly $200 mid-range board doesn't have? Excellent! Team Group's Dark Z series of DDR4 gaming memory features an aggressive yet stylish armored design with high performance aluminum alloy heat sinks to keep thermals in check. The Dark Z series uses specially selected high quality modules to achieve DDR4 speeds up to 3600 with XMP 2.0 support for easy setup and kits are available in capacities of up to 32 gigabytes per DIMM, perfect for a gaming PC or a high-end workstation. Click the sponsor link in the description for more. So here's how I think about motherboards in general when it comes to price range. You've got your super budget options, which are often as cheap as 50 to 80 bucks, which are invariably cut down in some stupid way. Like they only have two dim slots for memory or they have zero VRM cooling or they're using some kind of weak sauce chipset. So I generally avoid them. Then you've got the more standard budget boards starting around 80 or $90 going up into the low $100 range. Then there's the solid mid range from about 140 up to 200 bucks. Those are what I would classify as your middle class boards. Then you can step up to your upper middle class boards from say $200 to $300, then anything above $300 is high end in my book. These prices can scale up a bit if you're talking about a higher end chipset board like X570 for example, or if you're going for a high end desktop solution like TRX40. Uh, this is not TRX40, it's X399, but uh, you get the point. These are designed for Threadripper CPUs which now go all the way up to 64 cores. On the Intel high end desktop side, they're using X299 motherboards on the LGA2066 chipset. You get things with a high-end desktop platform like a lot of PCI Express lanes and stuff that can definitely be worth the money. But for today's purposes, I'm mainly focusing on the motherboard features rather than the capabilities of the platform overall. But the fact is for the vast majority of gaming PCs, you can almost always go with one of those well-reviewed budget boards around maybe $100, or you'd have a bit wider selection of those solid mid-range boards, uh, which might have a few more useful features for you in the say $150 to $200 bracket. That's almost always what I recommend. Meant. To reality check a bit though, let's look at actual motherboard pricing and availability right now on Newegg. So I'm just looking at motherboards and I'm just looking at AM4 socket CPUs, which would basically cover all of your AMD options. If I remove that AM4 filter, then you'll also start to see TRX40 boards in this list, and those can also be quite expensive. However, again, with the high-end desktop stuff, I think there's another argument to be made for content creators and people who are actually going to take advantage of stuff like 64 PCI Express lanes. Sticking to the AM4 socket type though, that will bring us down to the mainstream stuff, which is going to be based on the X570 chipset for the high end. Then you might see some B550 and B450 stuff in there as you scroll down. Now, if you get up to the max price range of $300 here, uh, you'll find quite a few different options with quite a few different features. But going beyond that, you'll see it suddenly scales up pretty quickly to $400. And then beyond that, you've got your $500, $600, and $700 options. But all across the top here, for $500 plus, you have ASRock, MSI, Asus, and Gigabyte. They all offer some variety of super high-end X570 motherboard. ASRock has the X570 Creator right here uh, for $500. MSI has the Prestige X570 Creation, very distinct from Creator. MSI also has their Godlike, uh, which is not currently for sale on Newegg, but that's the one that's actually going for $700 and is still X570. The Creation board is geared a little bit more towards content creation. Gigabyte has the X570 Aorus Extreme, which is the most expensive X570 motherboard listed on Newegg. However, it does have a unique feature that other X570 motherboards lack, or I guess it lacks a feature that other X570 motherboards have. It has a pretty extensive heat pipe heat dissipation configuration on this board, which means they don't have to have a fan. This is one of the only motherboards that has that. For Asus, you have the ROG Crosshair 8 Formula for X570, which is going for $600. And this being a formula board from the Asus ROG line, formula boards are always geared a little bit more towards water cooling. That's why this one has an integrated water block for the VRM, so the power delivery for the CPU. You can use this passively or you can pipe in with Gina Quarter fittings your own custom water cooled loop through that. 
So those are your mainstream AMD options if you're going for Ryzen. Uh, Intel, of course, also has high-end motherboards. And if you're just looking at Intel's current generation platforms, which is LGA 1200 for mainstream, 2066 and 3647 for your high-end desktops. And then LGA 1151 is uh, what was just recently supplanted with the launch of LGA 1200, but I'll, you can still find quite a few LGA 1151 options out there. That said, at the very top, you have LGA 3647, which uses a Intel C621 or C622 two chipset, EVGA, Gigabytes, and ASUS all have boards uh, designed for this platform. But these are basically server motherboards and even high-end server motherboards that have just been uh, branded for consumer purchase. So they're not really very practical to look at. So if we remove those, then we can see our mainstream high-end motherboards on Intel's mainstream platform, which is currently Z490 LGA 1200. There is even a Z390 Oris Extreme Water Force board still in here. But here you can see boards that cost like $1,300 for a motherboard, again, which is fairly absurd. But this one has a value proposition of like, hey, if you're going water cooling, why not buy a board that has the water cooling integrated? It's not just like a monoblock or something like you'd slap on, but it's actually designed to tie in with the aesthetics of the board. And this might be something that looks really cool to you, or maybe even that you're interested in if you're interested in water cooling. But but $1,300 just for the motherboard is, that's a, that's a significant price. That's a significant cost for that board. ASRock also did a Z490 water cooled in the Z490 Aqua, which is about $1,100. Here again, you can just see, I mean, these are cool configurations. They, they're they water cooling, not just the uh, CPU itself, but the VRMs around it and the chipset. That's not something that's easy to do if you're trying to build something yourself and get uh, custom parts, for example. So of course, you've got your water cooling support. You've got your high-end overclocking support. And there's a handful of other nice high-end options that motherboard manufacturers like to throw at boards like these. And I've gone through all these features and sorted them. So you've got actual useful features. We'll go, go over those first. You've got features that I find to be not useful or that you should look for other solutions for, and that's your not useful category, I guess. And then I've got the in-between. Might be useful depending on your situation. Let's start with the actually useful stuff that serves a practical or useful purpose, or it provides a feature or component that would otherwise be a costly upgrade that you might need to pay for separately. And the first thing at the top is a 10 gigabit NIC, or Network Interface Card. Uh, motherboards have shipped with uh, Ethernet jack for quite some time, just a standard RJ45 jack, and the standard there has been a gigabit connection for a long time, which is just fine for most people's at-home usage. However, if you want to step up, 10 gigabit has been the standard in the server and enterprise world for quite some time if you need to move a lot of data between computers or over a local area network. But the hardware for a 10 gigabit network has also been quite expensive. Uh, 10 gigabit adapter cards like this one here that ships uh, with stuff like the Asus Extreme boards, you can purchase now and you can actually get a, a decent 10 gigabit NIC for less than $100, but that's still around a $100 investment that, uh, hey, if it comes in the box, then you've already got that and you don't need to pay extra for it. And if you're looking at our list of uh, X570 expensive motherboard options here, whether you're looking at MSI, Asus, Gigabyte, or ASRock, all of these ship with an upgraded NIC or a network interface card. You can see that listed right here for ASRock, the Aquantia 10 gig LAN for MSI, 10 gigabit Super LAN, for Gigabyte as well, the uh, Quantia adapter, which is a, a common adapter to use in these higher end motherboards. And it's actually only the Asus board, which is $600 rather than 500, uh, which doesn't ship with that. It does have an upgraded NIC. It's just a, a five gig NIC. Yes, and a Quantia solution, but it only goes up to five gigabit. Now granted, you're gonna need network switches that are also 10 gigabit to take advantage of something like this. But if it's something that you're working on in your home or a small office or something like that, getting boards that already have it is something that you might be interested in. That said, again, you can easily buy adapter cards like this and pop them onto any board as long as they've got a pretty standard PCI Express uh, that looks like a buy four connection. But there it is. I consider that to be a useful thing. Here's my next useful thing, and that is an M.2 riser card, a multi-adapter card, something that allows you to add more M.2 storage drives onto your board than you might already have. A lot of boards like the Godlike will integrate multiple M.2 slots on the board, so this one has, I think, three integrated there. But positioning them right up against the board can often mean that they're stuck behind a graphics card or just don't have adequate airflow. So a riser card is often a good solution for allowing a little bit more airflow over the M.2 drives or just giving yourself a lot more slots for them. As long as, of course, you have the PCI Express bandwidth for that. And there you might be a little bit limited if you're going with like the Intel mainstream platform where you're only gonna have 16 PCIe lanes directly from the CPU. That gets into another question of whether you should go a main, with a mainstream platform or a high-end desktop platform, depending on the storage configuration you're putting together to try to stay grounded with the focus of this 
video though, I just wanted to point out that an additional M.2 riser card, and this is one that's actually sold separately from Asus, the Hyper M.2 by 16 riser card, or something that Asus has been doing for a few generations now, is they have their DIM.2 riser, which is basically like a memory slot with an adapter card that can fit two M.2 drives on either side, which is a really smart way, in my opinion, of allowing you to add a couple more drives to a board, and it holds them vertically, and it's in an area that's typically near the CPU and the VRM, so that's an area that will likely get some airflow over it. MSI also ships an M.2 Gen 4 expander card with their godlike boards, and that is one of those selling points of the boards. That said, add-on cards of this type can be purchased separately, and depending on uh, what they're capable of, they might, might cost anywhere from, I mean, you can get them for $25 to $30 if you're just looking for a single or maybe a two drive solution. If you want something that's Gen 4 capable that can maybe hold up to four drives and that maybe has some active cooling integrated onto it as well, they're gonna be looking at more like uh, $70, $80 or more. Actually, the newest version of Asus's card, which is the Hyper M.2 by 16, which is PCIe 4.0 capable, is only about $70 available on Amazon. And that one does have a little fan to help keep things cool and it does support four M.2 drives. So that's your second item I think that might be included with these boards that is useful, that does have a monetary value or function, uh, but it is also something that you could maybe buy separately. Something you can't buy separately is going to be the cooling on the motherboard itself, uh, unless you're going into custom water cooling, but more on that in just a second. Advanced cooling though is definitely something that you might pay a little bit more for on a motherboard. And as I already mentioned, this Gigabyte X570 Aorus Extreme, it really is a selling point of it, it being the only uh, X570 motherboard, at least to my knowledge, that is currently available that doesn't require an active fan on the chipset. Cooling solutions for a motherboard extend beyond just the cooling for the VRMs and the chipset themselves though. You might also have extra fan headers, uh, perhaps pump or AIO headers on a motherboard specifically. You might have more advanced control over those headers and the fan speeds in the BIOS. A good example I have for this is the mini ITX system that I put together uh, late last year, which has an ASUS Crosshair 8 Impact motherboard. That is a $450 motherboard, quite premium. It's actually a mini DTX motherboard, but that system in particular had a few fans in it. And as the fans were ramping up and down, they were wobbling, they were creating some noise. I could have swapped the fans out and tried something else, but instead I went into the ASUS fan control in the UEFI. They have a ramp speed and how much time that takes. By adjusting that ramp speed and how quickly it actually spins the fans up and spin them down, I was basically able to eliminate the noise. Having those features available on a motherboard are really nice, but again, this is something that also bleeds down into the mid-range and upper mid-range motherboards. They'll also, also often have those features as well. Now, I mentioned overclocking, and these highest-end boards should pretty much always have the best-in-class power delivery configurations as well as advanced overclocking tools. And this often includes an entire suite of features and it's very often in the upper right here of the motherboard so it can kind of be grouped somewhere that uh, can be easily accessible by a professional overclocker who might have the board out on an open test bed for example. But having something like an LN2 switch for extreme cooling options, surface mounted voltage read points where you can connect the multimeter to get actual true readouts for your memory and CPU voltage for example. And of course just simple quality of life improvements like surface mounted power and reset buttons and and other buttons that might uh, clear the memory settings, for example, or have a slow mode boot option. All these things might be really useful to an extreme overclocker. Uh, is that you though? Are you an extreme overclocker? Maybe you are, and maybe that's the reason you might be investing in a motherboard like this. However, I would also like to point out that when you add a bunch of stuff to a motherboard, when you throw everything but the kitchen sink at it, you're adding more complexity to it. And more complexity is often what you don't want when it comes to overclocking. With overclocking, it often helps to keep things as simple as possible. That is why, for example, Asus, as part of their ROG series, which is their highest end series of motherboards, has developed a board called the Apex, as opposed to say the Extreme. And that is why, if you look at the Asus ROG lineup of motherboards, they have uh, the Intel side, which is Maximus, they have the AMD side, which is Crosshair, if you're looking at the mainstream ones, and then they'll have either the Hero, which is kind of their entry-level ROG. They have the Formula, which is typically devoted to overclocking. They have the Impact, which is typically your mini ITX board. They've had the Gene in, in the past, which is micro ATX. I, I hope they bring that back at some point. They've got the Extreme, like this one right here, the Zenith Extreme. Zenith is for the Threadripper platform. And the Extreme is supposed to be the best, the top one that they make. However, 
However, they also have the Apex, and the Apex, as part of the ROG series, is an interesting board because it's just not really the most practical board for anyone who's building just a, a more normal system that you want to use at home on a day-to-day -day basis. It's actually built for overclocking, and you can see a lot of that going on here in the upper right, whether it's voltage read points, uh, or all these switches which do various things, or other buttons and, and things like that. Also note that there's only two memory slots on this board though. That simplifies things and that's really good for memory overclocking, and they've also positioned the memory as close to the CPU as possible. I guess they call that Optimum 3. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're trying to buy the motherboard that is the best at everything, uh, you might not actually be able to do that. You might be able to buy the motherboard that is the best, but if you want the motherboard that's the best for overclocking, at least if you're looking at ASUS boards, you'd probably want to go for the Apex. But if you're building a system for long-term use, the Apex might be missing some features that you might actually want. I guess all that is to say that if you want the best overclocking experience, yes, these really expensive motherboards will provide that for you. However, even in MSI's case, for example, their godlike motherboard has the exact same power delivery configuration as their ACE motherboard, which is still a $350 motherboard, which is expensive, but you can still get that power delivery on a much less expensive motherboard and not have to pay the godlike money. My next feature though is actually, if I'm being honest, the entire inspiration for this video, and that is LED lit audio jacks. Getting back to that mini ITX system that I built, it's been out in our living room and we've been setting it up occasionally to play video games out there while we also watch our daughter who's about 15 months old. This means I've been unplugging and replugging stuff into it pretty constantly and this also means I've gained a new appreciation for LED backlit audio jacks which to my knowledge is an ASUS only feature which also to my knowledge they had only been including on their highest end motherboards but they now also are starting to include it on lower end motherboards like I literally just found this out as I was planning another video the ROG Strix B550-i Gaming uh, which is a B550 motherboard which only costs around $220 also has LED lit audio jacks but I need to point this out because first of all it inspired this video I was looking at it and being like wow as I'm going to plug the, the mic and headphone for the headset in over and over again multiple times and unplugging it and replugging it and sometimes it's dark and just looking down at it and you have little lights that shine out and you're like oh the, the red one there is for the mic and the green one is for your standard stereo headphone and it just makes it a lot simpler to plug them in and the thought I had at the time was like ah oh, that's a convenient feature but this is a $450 motherboard and I've only seen it on Asus's really expensive stuff and then that got me thinking like, oh, well, what really actually useful features are there on really expensive motherboards and hence you have this video. I guess that one would boil down to if you plug and replug your mic and headphone jack uh, very, very often, then you should uh, perhaps invest in an Asus motherboard that has those LED lit jacks. Let's move to the uh, in-between stuff. This is kind of more situational or, or potentially aesthetic only improvements uh, that you would get when you pay more for a motherboard like this. And of course, a big one is gonna be the water cooling support. I almost classified this along with the overclocking support, but the fact is with overclocking, you might overclock or you might not, and you might just decide to do that at any point. Whereas with water cooling, especially for custom water cooling, you kind of need to plan ahead for that. So the reason this is in the middle tier is because for some people, they might look at something like the Z490 or extreme and they might be planning a water cooled build and they might just think oh my gosh I need this because it looks really cool because it integrates everything together because it cools the chipset and the VRMs and the CPU all, all at the same time and because if you were planning on water cooling a motherboard uh, you might actually have to invest some money for something like that I just quickly pulled up the EK uh, monoblocks uh, a monoblock is something that cools the CPU as well as the power delivery around it so this doesn't even include uh, chipset cooling but these are gonna cost you around $150 55-ish dollars, and yes, there are CPU blocks that are cheaper. There's also more advanced blocks that uh, might also cool the chipset that you can get that might cost more than this. However, I will say that if you want a fully integrated solution that's color matched with the rest of the aesthetics of the board, uh, and again, that also uh, might potentially cool the chipset, it's really hard to replace uh, some of these fully integrated solutions that have come out recently. The premium for these boards, though, is just insane. I mean, you're talking six, seven, eight hundred dollars over even like a five hundred dollar version of these motherboards. Boards, so you'd really have to be dedicated to your water cooling setup and also willing to spend a significantly higher amount of money to get that configuration as opposed to something like a monoblock or just 
air cooling. Other things that I think are in the sort of middle category where they might be useful to you or they might not would be advanced RGB lighting panels. And these aren't just the headers on the motherboard themselves, but a lot of motherboards are now including little extra panels on the board. The Godlike has like this display area over here where lucky the dragon will come out and dance around for you. And maybe that floats your boat and you think it's awesome and you should totally get it. I just find it to be more in the middle category because uh, lighting panels like that tend to, they're aesthetic touches, uh, so it's not going to contribute to your performance. And being an aesthetic touch, you may or may not find it aesthetically pleasing. Similarly, a lot of uh, motherboards now are including backplates, and backplates are something that we often call out for when it comes to a graphics card because it's very visible. A backplate on a motherboard I find to be nice, but not ultimately that useful, simply because when the motherboard's actually installed, you're not going to be seeing the backplate at all anymore in the vast majority of setups. Now that I think about it, maybe the backplate should go in the category of things you should not pay more for at all, but um, some people see a motherboard backplate and they, they go crazy, like, oh my gosh, motherboard has a backplate. That's kind of how I reacted at first, but they're just not all that practical. Uh, also, what's not all that practical is just uh, what I call a really cool design. So a lot of higher end motherboards actually look pretty cool and I will hand it to a lot of the motherboard manufacturers. They have designers who are designing not just for function, but also for form now because a lot of people pay attention to that as they build their own computer. I've looked at plenty of budget entry level motherboards and you looked at them and they're like, oh, you know, it looks okay, but it's not that great. The higher end you get though, the more beefy and substantial motherboards look and uh, there might be some pretty cool design elements there. Again, something that I wouldn't necessarily recommend you pay a bunch more for, but for some people, they see a design and they're like, oh my gosh, that speaks to me. That's what I need to put in my next system. So that's why I placed that in the middle category. It might affect you, it might not. Here are extras that in my opinion, you should not be paying more for. The first is high-end audio. And this is actually one of the selling points for a lot of different motherboards. Yes, motherboard audio has improved and most motherboards have audio solutions that are perfectly adequate. And even the high-end motherboards have audio solutions that are demonstrably better. And they even start to get into crossover features like support for uh, high impedance headphones and stuff like that. In my opinion though, if you really wanna get into that audiophile category and you're talking about using your computer as a source, you should invest in a DAC. An external DAC to be more specific, they're probably gonna cost you $200 or more, but if you really want that audiophile high-end experience, you should remove the analog to digital conversion from the electrically noisy environment of your computer and put it separately somewhere else then you just connect via USB. USB signal is digital, so it's not subject to interference. And then you'll have a much nicer experience with your audio. That's not to say that the uh, integrated high-end audio is worthless in these uh, more expensive motherboards. It's just that if you're really getting into that stuff, uh, a DAC is absolutely the way to go. Also an integrated LED panel. I kind of talked about that being sort of the fancier features here, but they also have these LED panels integrated that, you're sp that are supposed to display pertinent system information and stuff like that. And in my opinion, when it's uh, attached to a mother board sitting there back in the case with maybe a, a tinted tempered glass side panel in front of it and RGB LEDs going on and stuff like that. It's just hard to see. Practically speaking, it's difficult to actually get any useful information from those types of panels. So for that solution, I would advise getting a separate uh, little LED panel, which you can connect up via USB and control on your own via software. A debug LED is okay, and I definitely uh, approve and recommend of that, but uh, those more advanced panels, I think, are just not worth paying the extra money for the motherboard for. Finally, anything less than a 10 gigabit NIC, you shouldn't be investing in the motherboard for because 10 gigabit NICs are easy to get a hold of. And in my opinion, going less than 10 gigabit is kind of cutting things down. I was actually a little disappointed when I saw that the Crosshair 8 formula did not have a 10 gigabit NIC. I have one last category, which is actually useful features, but useful features that are also potentially available on mid-range boards. So these are features that I recommend you shop for, but uh, you don't necessarily need to pay 700 bucks in order to get. I have a full video that I already did on this, so I'll link that in the description if you wanna watch that whole thing. It's called five, my five favorite motherboard features, but I'm just gonna run down them really quickly. First off, surface mounted power and reset buttons. Very useful to have. Typically not found on your super budget or mid-range budget boards, but uh, once you get to the mid-range and higher, that will often be something that's included. An LED post readout or debug LED is usually a two digit LED readout that, dis that displays a code as your system is booting up. Useful for troubleshooting. And then often after your system boots, it will show your system temperature. And since it's larger LED numbers, that's usually readable too. Uh, the ability to flash your UEFI or BIOS without a CPU or memory installed, I think is just one of the most useful features. It's called different things by different companies. Uh, Asus calls it USB BIOS flashback. I think MSI calls it BIOS flashback plus. 
But that's really nice to have, especially on the uh, Ryzen series motherboards because there's lots of new Ryzen CPUs that come out that are compatible with other mother older motherboards, but you need to update the older motherboard in order to recognize the, ne the new CPU. Another thing you might need while troubleshooting is a clear CMOS button and having that externally on the rear IO panel is really helpful as well. If you need to just reset the BIOS back to default so you can get back into it to adjust some settings or if you're going for an overclock that didn't work out, that's really nice to have. And finally, those advanced fan controls. Most motherboards will have some level of this, but advanced fan controls combined with more fan headers on the board will also give you more flexibility for setting up your fans the way you want to, and also having a lot of them if you want lots of airflow to keep things nice and cool. And all of those things can often be found on motherboards that cost around 200 bucks, and that's still my recommendation most of the time. And there is a reason that my motherboard recommendations for building a gaming PC tend to all be about in the one to $200 price range. Most people really just don't need much more than that. Unless you're devoting yourself to one of the more costly niches of PC building, extreme overclocking, or custom water cooling, the extra features that a $700 motherboard provide often go unused or can be purchased separately as ad hoc upgrades like a 10 gigabit NIC or an M.2 PCIe adapter if they are really needed. But please don't feel bad if you've already gone out and bought a high-end motherboard. It's not really my intent with this video. Building your own PC is about choosing the parts that suit your needs or your aesthetic tastes best. And if the board you've got your eye on has that perfect mix of looks and features and maybe one or two drool-worthy high-end things you can't go without, then you should just go for it and be confident in your decision. But that is going to wrap it up for this video, you guys. And I'm very curious if there was anything I missed. I tried to be pretty thorough in going over the features that are available on the current generation of high-end motherboards, but maybe there's something in there that you were like, oh my gosh, I need that motherboard even if it's 600 bucks because it has this. Let me know what that thing is and what that motherboard is down in the comment section down below. While you're down there of course in the description I'll put links to uh, various things I've talked about today and links to websites and stuff like that. Also a link to my store where you can buy stuff at paulshardware.net shirts, mugs, pint glasses to help support my channel and get yourself some super sweet merch. If you want to hit the thumbs up button on the way out that is very much appreciated as well. Thank you very much for watching this video you guys and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you